An often overlooked fact is that both the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 are capable of outputting a native 1080p image, and that's in actual games, not video playback. Nearly a decade ago, back in the good old days circa 2009, Ascaron, a rather obscure German developer that later went bottoms up, released Sacred 2. As you might have guessed from the name, Sacred 2 was a generic quest log filling time sink, a meh RPG if there ever was one, except for the fact that one thing set it apart. At a time when Full HD wasn't even where 4K is today, with a dearth of real content made up for by upscaling DVD players and other varieties of snake oil, Sacred 2 offered a native 1080p experience on PS3 and Xbox 360, with a super sampling option thrown in for the players still hooked up to standard def TVs. Of course, the only reason Sacred 2 ran at 1080p is because of visuals that hark back to vanilla World of Warcraft. You can do graphics, or you can hit a resolution target, but you can't do both. Does that remind you of something? In many ways, the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One X are this era's Sacred 2 playing machines. 4K TVs are here to stay, but even today, between compressed Netflix streams that eat up your bandwidth and look worse than Blu-ray, and a set of real 4K movies that's small enough to fit in a listicle, there still isn't much native 4K content available apart from those demo videos they keep on loop at Best Buy. Of course, that's going to change. Sometime in the early 2020s, 4K will be just as ubiquitous as 1080p is today, and we'll all be gaping at those 8K HDR monitors that are just around the corner. But until then, TV manufacturers, and by extension, console makers, have a bit of a content problem on their hands. The solution? 4K gaming. Simply running existing games at high resolutions will give the owners of 4K TVs something to gawk at, and which, of course, look better than any existing full HD content on hand. This is literally the only reason the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One X exist. But cynicism aside, these new consoles, the Xbox One X in particular, do give us a hint as to how image quality will shape up in the coming 9th gen. The fabled PlayStation 5 and Xbox One X2? Xbox 2X? Seriously, Microsoft, get your marketing act together. Just like the PS3 and Xbox 360 were able to handle 1080p and Sacred 2 within the constraints of PS2 era tech, the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One X are able to run existing games at 4K. Unfortunately, this means that today's 4K don't gain much apart from the genuine boost in crispiness. Core technology is still limited within the bounds of what can run on 2012-era mid-range hardware. Moreover, the mid-gen refresh consoles, the PS4 Pro in particular, aren't that much more powerful than their predecessors. Just running existing 1080p titles at 4K requires a 4 times increase in rendering power. There simply isn't enough headroom to deliver much more than that. Moreover, the One X and the PS4 Pro have scarcely improved their CPU power relative to the Xbox One and PS4, and those two weren't that great a step up from the PS3 and Xbox 360 either in that respect. Substantially increased processing power is the only way, apart from GPU compute, which for obvious reasons saps away rendering power, to bring about a paradigm shift in games, leveraging more advanced AI, physics, and world building to create new kinds of gameplay experiences, rather than making existing gameplay prettier. 2014's Assassin's Creed Unity, which chokes on consoles due to CPU bottlenecking but absolutely shines on high-end PCs, remains one of the few examples of what such a paradigm shift would look like. When the real next-gen arrives, CPU and GPU hardware will reach the stage where 4K 30 frames per second and 4K 60 FPS titles will both look better and offer greater immersion than anything that currently exists on the market. But what would this actually look and feel like? While 2015's The Witcher 3 certainly offered sweeping landscapes and an engrossing narrative, the open world structure did expose some of its technical limitations. The way Geralt interacts with the world and with items hasn't changed much since The Witcher 2. The majority of in-game assets are essentially props, static place settings, cages, tables, and shelves that contribute to atmosphere but don't really exist in a tangible manner. In that sense, interactiveness is paper thin when it comes to much of the game. 
Of course, it can be argued that shuffling pots and pans around isn't the purpose in a narrative title, but that's exactly the point. In the coming generation, greater computing resources will remove the constraints that result in staged environments, instead creating lived-in, interactive spaces irrespective of genre. Increased interactivity can also result in emergent, player-driven experiences that blur genres even more. Take fence posts for example. In today's Far Cry games, fence posts are interactive if you limit your definition of interactivity to destroying them with your car. This has some rather disconcerting post-structuralist implications. In the real world, at least you can objectively separate the existence of a fence post from discourses about a fence post, what it could be and how it could be used. In the real world, you could dig up a fence post, carve it into a sculpture, or write about it. In the real world, fence posts have inherent properties. They're made of wood, they have a certain weight, they don't depend on your specific actions. That means you can use them in any conceivable way, or ignore them entirely. But in today's games, fence posts don't exist objectively. They either serve to funnel you into a fixed location, or act as destructible objects that fade away the moment you turn the camera away, or sometimes even before. If the appalling compute limitations of the current consoles go away, and if in-game items become defined as persistent, physics-based objects, this would radically change the way in which games are experienced and how genre is perceived. Would Far Cry be a first-person shooter if you could drop your gun, dig out two pairs of fence posts, pitch them on opposite sides, and kick a chicken between them? What would happen if you punched someone in the stands in FIFA? Would it even be a football game anymore? These questions become even more relevant when you factor in the rise of VR. The main reason VR experiences feel real as opposed to something akin to watching IMAX is presence. When your grippy Oculus Touch hands appear in front of you and you can actually pick things up, observe them, toss them at the wall, your environment becomes a lot more than a decked out stage because the objects that comprise it at least appear to have an objective existence. That over there is a pot, not a representation of a pot, because you can get up close to it, turn it over in your hands, stuff some other objects inside of it, suiting collision detection allows it. It's the perception that the assets in an environment exist objectively, independent of your actions, that leads to a feeling of presence. In contrast, the way we engage with games like The Witcher 3 has more in common with listening to a story or watching a stage play. The pot over there is a representation of a pot. Move too close to it and Geralt might clip right through. The representational pot requires suspension of belief in a way that the real VR pot does not. As the vanishing of Ethan Carter and Frictional Studios' work goes to show, the objective existence of objects isn't limited to VR. A part of what makes the vanishing of Ethan Carter's narrative so compelling is its ability to engage with the environment objectively. Picking up objects, flipping through pages, reading through smudged ink, as opposed to going through a quest log or chasing points on a map. With computing constraints lifted, these kinds of experiences no longer need to be restricted to the confines of a walking simulator. Think open worlds with this kind of moment-to-moment -moment presence experienced in the likes of What Remains of Edith Finch and Everybody's Gone to the Rapture. This is what the ninth gen is going to look like, barring unsustainably high development costs. Just imagine a loot box that you can pry open with your... <sighs> Never mind. The current mid-cycle refresh consoles give us a good idea of what next-gen 4K gaming may look like frame to frame. However, if the PS5 and Xbox whatever successfully eliminate CPU constraints, likely thanks to a Ryzen-based platform, the experience of playing games will likely experience a paradigm shift. As well, it should. It's almost 2020 for crying out loud. It's supposed to be the future. And that'll be about it for this one. If you guys like what we're doing at Gaming Vault, please consider subscribing to our channel, and I'll see you guys on the next video.